So now when we classify infectious disease, we need to remember So now when we classify infectious disease, we need to remember these three uh, classifications. Communicable disease, disease that is spread from one host to another. Example, tuberculosis, chicken pox, measles. A contagious disease is one that spreads rapidly, okay? Chicken pox and measles. A non-communicable disease, the best example is tetanus, which is a disease that is not contagious and is not spreading from one host to the other. The occurrence of a disease can be divided into five or six different uh, topics. So uh, one is the incidence. Incidence is the number of newly diagnosed cases. Cases. Prevalence includes the old and the new cases. So you count whatever was already in the population plus the new cases. Sporadic is a disease that occurs only occasionally. Endemic is a disease that is always present in a population. An example would be the common cold. Epidemic is a disease that is acquired by many people in an area, specific area, in a short period of time. Example, influenza. Pandemic would be worldwide epidemic. So a pandemic is, is, is considered when an epidemic is already spread into multiple countries, multiple continents. So when we started to see uh, the spread of COVID-19, for example, which is some topic that we're looking and, and seeing in the news every day and living, um, we remember that it started as an epidemic, right? And then started to spread from country to country until the CDC defined it as a pandemic. If I show you this example, think about so here we have, let's say from 1991, the amount, the number of new cases of individuals that had, let's make this line like here, individuals that had AIDS uh, was endemic at around 40,000. So around 40,000 cases would increase per year from 1991 forward. But in 1994 or 1993, I guess, uh, there was an expansion, a huge increase in the number of cases, right? And this would here be considered an epidemic, okay? And then after this epidemic, you see how 250,000 cases increased uh, in just within three years then the numbers started to go down again and you went back to the endemic level. Uh, when we think about the severity or the duration of the disease, you can classify diseases as acute, chronic, or latent. Acute, the symptoms develop rap rapidly, but the disease lasts only a short time. For example, the influenza or flu. A chronic disease, the symptoms develop slowly and last a long time to disappear. Example, tuberculosis and hepatitis B. Also, mononucle infectious mononucleosis can be chronic and become chronic. A latent disease is caused, uh, is caused by an agent that is inactive in the body for a time, but then activates and produces symptoms. Examples. If one day, if you had chicken pox in the past, one day you may develop shingles, okay? Cold sores from simplex virus that lodges in uh, nerve endings and stay there until you get a new reactivation and those sores appear again. Those are all latent diseases. Herd immunity is immunity in most of the population. So when you think about um, sustained transmission, you always are, you're always gonna have one case 
so this is a sick person that infects a susceptible person and that susceptible person then can infect and can be between two sick people so you you always find somebody to keep the chain going let's say this first person and this third person are not close enough to get in contact or this first and this fourth person are not going to be close enough but through the second person the first person infects the second and the third person infects the fourth so everybody is sick right or carries that that uh, microbe when we think about transmission terminated that's where we have herd immunity so you have one case but hopefully and thankfully this second person here is immune let's say because this person was vaccinated vaccination is the way to acquire herd immunity so this person is not going to infect the third person that is susceptible because this person is immune so this person creates a barrier here for the sick case to you know cause one more sick person um when we talk about um extents extent of the host involvement you think about three different uh classifications if an infection is local the pathogens are limited to a small area of the body let's say you have a wound that wound is infected that's a local infection um systemic or generalized is when the infection is throughout the body it it's accommodating more than one or two or three sites okay and there's probably already signs of that infection in the blood so if you measure inflammatory chemicals they will be present in the blood in this type of oops in this type of involvement here the systemic one the focal infection is when the systemic infection is like what is going to lead to the systemic infection right so you have a local the local can migrate to a second spot so the infection moves around right the microbes are migrating to another spot making a focal infection so that secondary site is what is going to spread the disease to multiple places and could become systemic okay In the same token, when we're talking about the extent of host involvement, we need to think about sepsis and the difference between sepsis and bacteremia. Sepsis is when you have toxic inflammatory chemicals circulated in the blood because of the spread of the microbes, especially bacteria or toxins produced by bacteria. They always come from a focal infection, right? And then septicemia would be also known as blood poisoning when the amount of toxics in the blood increase and causes symptoms you call that back you call that septicemia while bacteremia is just the presence of bacteria in the blood they're not necessarily growing in the blood like in the septicemia okay toxemia um is the presence of toxins in the blood toxins produced by bacteria okay or other microbes viremia is the presence of viruses in the blood primary infection would be an acute infection that causes an initial illness and that could predispose this patient to a secondary infection so when you have a secondary infection that means that came from already compromised patient with the first infection and then you could have an opportunistic infection after this primary infection example here if somebody has AIDS the person and is not being treated right and the AIDS is already established and showing symptoms that person with a weak immune system that uh, that is you know the, the weakness that is triggered by the HIV virus is going to be more prone to develop a secondary infection for example a pneumonia by a fungus okay so that would be secondary 
Subclinical infection does not have any noticeable signs or symptoms, so it's an inapparent infection. Incubation period is the interval between initial infection and first signs. So now we're talking about how the disease develops. So it's, I think it's easier if I show you this graph. So incubation, you still, you're starting to multiply those microbes. Prodomal, you have mild signs or symptoms. And then after that, you have the period of illness where um, this is where microbes are actively multiplying. And most of the symptoms here are severe and signs are also severe. And then with the decline, when the microbes are starting to die, you still can have symptoms and signs. And in the covalence period is the period where the body is readjusting and healing from whatever lesion the microbe caused in the tissues, right? Example here, I don't know if you guys are hearing with COVID-19 that after the period of decline of COVID, the person still goes a long period. So this convalescence period can be shorter or longer, depending on the size of the damage. So uh, patients sometimes, depending on the severity of the COVID case, uh, the person starts to develop uh, uh, symptoms that come just from the lesions that happen in the lungs and they lack that oxygen because the lungs were not working and that would cause a period of covalences to be longer, right? The person will get much, take much longer to heal because those tissues are going to heal slower. It's important to note here <clears throat> that when you are uh, in any one of these periods and stages of uh, the disease, you can be infected. So some diseases, even in the period of convalescence, you can still be infected if the virus becomes or the microbe becomes latent in your body. I said virus because it made me think about herpes virus. So even when you're not showing symptoms anymore, you can still infect somebody with herpes virus by direct contact, right? Um, so that's important to keep in mind. So now we're going to talk about um, reservoirs of infection. So the microbe that is infecting this new host always comes from somewhere, right? Where does it come from? It can come from human reservoirs. And in this case, you have uh, humans. They're carriers of the infection that could be inapparent or later or latent. Um, for example, somebody that has HIV. HIV can pass from one person to the other through blood, through sexual intercourse, and humans are the reservoirs, okay? You don't get HIV from another source. When animals are the reservoirs, we call this diseases zoonosis. So zoonosis are diseases that um, were, were transmitted to humans through animals. Examples here <clears throat> that we could use are plague transmitted by mice, rats, um, leptospirosis, toxoplasmosis, which is transmitted from cats or cattle, um, and malaria, rabies, all these are zoonoses, right? Transmitted from animals. <clears throat> also, we have non-living reservoirs. So diseases like cholera, legionella come from the water. Anthrax come from the soil. So these are ways that diseases can also spread through soil and water, which are non-living reservoirs. Uh, you can also contract a disease by direct, indirect contact, or droplet. So direct contact requ it requires close association between infected and susceptible hosts. Examples are touch, kiss, sexual intercourse. Examples of diseases that can be transmitted through this uh, ways, through direct contact. Cold, flu, um, syphilis, AIDS infectious mononucleosis. So here we're not really talking about 
if the contact is uh, by respiratory system or parenteral, we're just saying you need to be close to that person for it to spread to you. And then through some of these ways that we're going to learn in the next chapter, you can transmit the disease. In direct contact, it's usually because there is a non-living object that we call fomite. Fomites can be syringes, can be equipment in our hospitals, um, instruments that are used, for example, in a surgery, all these can be called fomite. Or it could be like somebody that steps on a rusted nail on the floor and can, you know, get tetanus because the Clostridium tetani loves to live in those little pores of the rust, rusted metal. So that's another example. It doesn't need to be an instrument in the hospital. A catheter is another example um, uh, and so on. But it doesn't need to be in a health care facility. It could be by accident somewhere else, right? But it's just an object that is transmitting that disease. Droplet transmission is when airborne droplets travel less than a meter. So, for example, during coughing, sneezing, laughing, talking, you can transmit influenza, pneumonia, whooping cough. These are examples. COVID-19 as we're talking about it, right? So these are just illustrations for you on how these diseases are can be transmitted. And like, if you think about preventing direct contact transmission, always the use of gloves, masks, and face shields are super effective. So when we think about what kind of vehicle is going to transmit an inanimate uh, the disease, you think you call them the inanimate reservoirs, right? So just uh, amplifying a little bit here, um, the non-living reservoirs that we said, it could be water, it could be soil, it could be foodborne, it could be airborne. There are particles that are not necessarily droplets that travel through air. For example, you can have spores of fungi traveling through the air and reaching your um, air pathway, you know, through your, your nose or through your mouth. And those are carried by the wind because they're super tiny. They're microscopic. So they don't need a droplet. They can be trans, uh, transported by the air. So one disease that we can talk about that is transmitted like this is histoplasmosis. So the histoplasma capsulatum is a fungus that causes this, uh, this spores to detach from the main mold and they're transported by air. Measles also are uh, considered an airborne disease. Tuberculosis, uh, some streptococcus can also be trans transported by air. So going up here, talking about foodborne, which would be examples of foodborne transmission. Tapeworm, transmitted by meat, cattle, pig, or pork meat. Food poisoning, staphylococcal infection or intoxication that can be transmitted by some food that is contaminated with that bacterium. And you usually have a lot of cross-contamination of food when somebody is touching one food and then the food has a bacterium and in touch another food, you can have contamination through this path. Um, waterborne, like I said, we can consider cholera, shigellosis, leptospirosis, diseases that are waterborne because you drink water contaminated with these microbes and you can get sick. So here are the examples that I just mentioned to you. So in the next video, I'm going to talk about the vectors, and then we're going to talk a little bit about hospital-associated infections. See you soon. Bye.